The much-anticipated 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, or CPC, has successfully wrapped up, having outlined the strategic tasks for China for the next five years and beyond. With Xi Jinping as General Secretary, members of the Politburo Standing Committee of the 20th CPC Central Committee met the press. What are the ramifications for the world in the foreseeable future? What accounts for the high support for and trust in in the top leadership by the Chinese people. While pursuing a Chinese path to modernization, will China still be open to the outside world? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. My guest today is renowned scholar Professor Zhang Weiwei, Dean of China Institute at Fudan University, joining me from Shanghai. Thank you, with pleasure. I want to start with some impressive numbers looking at uh, the, what China has achieved over the past 10 years under the past, uh, uh, under the President Xi Jinping's leadership. For instance, China has lifted nearly 100 million people out of uh, absolute poverty. That's about three quarters of the global reduction in the number of, living, of people living in extreme poverty. In terms of carbon reduction, China's uh, carbon emissions per unit of the GDP have dropped by more than one third in a decade. And China's average contribution to the global economic growth also exceeded 30% in the past decade on an annual basis. What made these contributions by China to the world possible? Well, uh, I think China is one of the few countries that have found its way to success. And this is very important. Uh, we call the Chinese style modernization. I often use the phrase China model. And this model has worked, is working, and will work in the future. I'm pretty sure about this. And uh, for instance, in the Chinese model, we give top priority to uh, people's livelihood and its improvement. In other words, whatever you do, the state does. Economic policy, social policy, political policies, they all must, in the end, boil down to delivering tangible benefits to the people both material and non-material. So that's important. And this is ancient philosophy in Chinese political governance culture. And now in this new era, this tradition has been carried forward and evolving into the new style, which is impressive, yeah. What is the place of the Chinese Communist Party in the Chinese model you just mentioned? Uh, in the case of China, uh, as I often say, you know, China is uh, civilizational state. In other words, it's an amalgamation of hundreds of states into one of its long history. On, uh, on the other hand, it's also a super large modern state. So the tradition of Chinese governments has always been since 221 BC when China was first unified. Uh, China has a unified ruling entity. Otherwise, the country disintegrated. We tried the American model adversary political party model, and the country disintegrated, generated, degenerated into civil wars. So the Chinese Communist Party is this tradition, the continuation of this tradition, uh, unified the ruling entity. And uh, in other words, compared with Western political party, the Chinese Communist Party is what I call holistic interest party. The Western poli part, political parties are in most cases partisan interest parties. So with a, a kind of holistic interest party, that makes all the difference. You can really plan for the future. You can work in the interest of the overwhelming majority of the people, rather than simply uh, for voters driven politics. So this is very different. President Xi Jinping has said the uh, Communist Party of China is the choice of history and the people. Is that what you mean just now? How do you understand this phrase? Because it's uh, simple in the sense that CPC uh, founded the uh, People's Republic of China, what we call the New China, after 22 years of uh, armed struggle. And the CPC is an indigenous political party. 
this political force came from the Chinese grassroots. They organized uh, Chinese peasants into a powerful force for change. At that time, Chinese society was made up of, uh, say, 95% peasants. So they, unif they organized this kind of peasants' associations and then the Red Army. So it's an armed struggle, 22 years, and then into the victory in 1949, founding of the new China. And then since then, what you see is impressive track record of performance. If you look at the uh, living standard of Chinese people and the life expectancy, they've changed so much, you know, over the past four decades. So as a result, uh, this is what we call the choice of the people, choice of history. Yeah. One thing that uh, China has always been attacked is the way how China elect its leaders. But if you look at some of the Western accounts recently, for instance, there was this uh, uh, newly reviewed uh, uh, interviews that's conducted with former U.S. President Donald Trump by the famous uh, journalist Woodward. You can tell that President Trump was going to his work day by day. He didn't plan. He just followed his instinct and see how the day goes. How have the Western system, how come the Western system is producing leaders such as this? In comparison, what's the advantage of the Chinese political system? The two systems are vastly different. The Western model is essentially about election, uh, election driven, uh, voters oriented. So the key problem with that is uh, populism, this trend towards low-minded populism has become inevitable. That's why we have the phenomenon you saw. Yeah, British Prime Minister and Donald Trump. The Chinese system is much more sophisticated. If the US system, American system, UK system is about election, our system is about selection plus election. In other words, a top leader or if we want to become one of the top leaders, uh, minimum requirements in the case of China, in most cases, say two or three turns of a uh, number one of a Chinese province or two provinces. In other words, before the Chinese leaders come to this top leadership level, top echelon leadership, they have already governed at least 100 million people. So by far, the for, Chinese for leadership extensive is far period of more time. competent. Yeah. It's, it's uh, much more competent than the Western leaders. We produce statesmen. They produce politicians. So uh, with all my Chinese modesty, the Western political system outdated. What does the continuity of the Chinese leadership mean to China and to the world? What does that mean? for China in this critical moment as China is trying to achieve its goal of uh, building a strong, modernized country? I think it's uh, widely acknowledged today. The world is in a fast changing phase where there's so many unpredictable events occurring, you know, every other month. So in this time of uh, unpredictability. China produces predictability. This is very important. That again shows and highlights the advantage of the China model. You select competent leaders, well-tested, experienced, competent, sophisticated, and predictable because they have their decades of performance. So China is by far the most predictable country. We know how China will be like five years from now, 10 years from now. If you look at the plans produced by the Chinese leaders and Chinese leadership over the past several decades, in most cases, these plans, five-year plans and 10-year plans are uh, co completed ahead of the schedule uh, or even a bit over fulfilled. So that's predictability. The Chinese love predictability. 
What do you see as the purpose? I mean, is that the purpose why President Xi Jinping is serving a third term? We understand there are some new standing committee members of the Politburo of the CPC Central Committee. There are some newcomers and there are existing um, members from the previous term of the uh, uh, Central Committee. How do you look at such a way of arrangement? What does it signal? Uh, firstly, you know, uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping is by far the extremely competent leader. And he is very popular among the Chinese population. Uh, he had delivered so much uh, for the country and for its people over the past decade. And uh, uh, so Chinese are really are very demanding for their leadership. You know, you have to be experienced competent, sophisticated, and decisive at the critical moment. And Xi Jinping has shown all these qualities. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, 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 his re-election to this post is widely endorsed by the Chinese population. And this is common sense in China. And for other leaders, if you look at the new leadership, once in certain, the Chinese know these leaders, we know they are competent. So this is, again, uh, a sign of uh, China's predictability. It's also good not only for China, also for the rest of the world. Because, you know, they are competent, they are sophisticated, they know China, they are experienced, well-tested, under stresses, yeah. And then they are, again, uh, take up new leadership role. So this is important. Looking back, when the party constitution was advised five years ago, there are a lot of comments, and one comment mm -hmm. that the Chinese leader was going to be a president for life. How mm -hmm. do you look at this comment for now? Is he going to be? No, this is against common sense. If you understand ABC of the Chinese Communist Party, if you look at the constitution of the party, it's stated very clearly, uh, no leader of any position, if you are a member of the CPC, this position cannot be lifelong tenure. Not a single party member can have a lifelong job. So there is no such a term as a, for life. No, this is ridiculous, laughable, yeah. But on the other hand, if you look at the other political systems, see Chancellor Arden of Germany, four terms, Chancellor Merkel, four terms, uh, President Roosevelt, four terms. And in most of these cases, they did not have this kind of constitutional stipulation, the term limits or no lifelong tenure. But we have strict uh, stipulation, no lifelong tenure. So simply within this political structure, a competent leader can work a bit longer than others. This is a, a very good arrangement. So if you look at the Western political system, I remember Winston Churchill famous as, you know, uh, roughly our citizen not good, but other citizens are worse off. In Chinese, we create a phrase called the least bad model. The Chinese political system also had this arrangement. Any leader at any position for certain reasons health, competence, or other reasons, there is this exit uh, which arranged in the political uh, institutions, no doubt about this. But what advantage we have over the Western political system is we not only have this least bad approach, we also have the best of the best approach. That you have to select as far as possible the most competent leader and leaders, so that country is led by competent leadership. So this uh, was a com combination of the least bad option and the best, best option made the Chinese model, I think, more and better than uh, the, the, the Western political model. China mm. has stressed 
uh, or the CPC has stressed on multiple occasions that the party exercises overall leadership over all areas of endeavor in every part of the country. How is such extensive power being yeah. checked uh, so that yeah. we can ensure efficiency, we can ensure uh, no corruption or no widespread mm -hmm. rampant corruption? How effective mm -hmm. has such self-oversight yeah. been? No, in the first place, this is party's overall leadership it is about the sense of direction. This is crucial. For instance, in the banking industry, the sense of direction is uh, this sector should serve the real economy rather than speculative economy. So this is a direction and part be responsible for that. So each other's success is indispensable from this kind of sense of direction ensured by a holistic interest party. Indeed, if you look at the international arena, where the country has a political force which represents the holistic interest of the country, of the people, that makes crucial and key difference. Yeah. And as for the oversight within the party, China now has uh, arguably the strictest internal supervision, both the rules and institutions. For one thing, with uh, new technology, uh, literally any Chinese citizen or even foreigners, if you detect any sign of uh, corruption, even a lavish dinner, <laughs> whatever, you can work on one you press one button on your smartphone and this message or this photo will be sent to the party central disciplinary commission. Yeah. So most Chinese view so much better today than 10 years ago in terms of uh, fighting corruption. For many years, people thought the issue of corruption may never be resolved. But now most people think it can be resolved. It is being resolved. So this is uh, how most Chinese feel about it. Uh, people are also wondering, is the country still willing to open up itself to best practices, to new <laughs> ideas, new concepts from the outside world, and uh, even to constructive opinions from others? And um, don't worry about this, because uh, China has a, a time-honored tradition of uh, learning from others. It's part of our genes, you know, we want to learn from others, whatever good you have done better than us, we try to learn from you. And I can give you an example. Uh, in Shanghai, we have the, I think the largest Tesla Motors factory in Shanghai. Thanks to this uh, Shanghai base, Tesla uh, has made a lot of profits. At the same time, you know, we have also made a requirement for Tesla. In other words, uh, except uh, the chips they want to keep secret and whatever, computing uh, power they want to keep secret. But for all the spell parts, they must be produced locally. So now this uh, whole uh, production chain has been set up both for Tesla, for other electric cars in China. So China learned a lot from Tesla, and now Chinese uh, electric cars are internationally competitive. So this is a good case of win-win um, uh, for both Chinese companies and for American companies. How do you see the relationship between the highlighted Chinese-ness in our past to modernization and China being part mm. of the world. Do you see a conflict there or do you see it uh, in some other ways, Professor Zhang? Well, China is, as I said, a civilizational state. But one thing uh, great about Chinese culture is it's a genuine passion for learning from others and for peace. If you look at the Western history, how the Western powers
became dominant power and industrialized. It's a history of wars. Yeah. But China has risen to, to this level by purchasing power parity. China was already the world's largest economy uh, in the year 2014. Yet, China did not fire a single shot against other countries. No wars. We look at the United States over the past four decades. How many wars, how many bloodshed, how many violations of human rights of other peoples the United States has committed? So very different cultures, very different visions, uh, very different style of uh, civilization. Yeah. Looking from now to the next five years, what kind of uh, attitude or strategy will China hold in its relationship with the U.S.-led West? Uh, will there mm. be an all-out confrontation? American uh, uh, security strategy just released a few days ago in mid-October. Right. Uh, obviously, you saw the scenario of um, new Cold War. And Cold War was based on this overall thinking. It's called the mutually assured destruction. I said on many occasions to my American friends, friends in the West, why China United States cannot form mutually assured prosperity. We have all the possibilities to do that if you are liberate yourself from Cold War mentality. So really, it's up to the United States. China is confident, yeah, we can do well with the United States in its bilateral relations, in win-win situations. How can China bring quality opportunity to the world while it's transitioning to a high quality development under the current difficulties? If you look at the Chinese uh, model of modernization, there are always uh, two levels, strategy and tactics. On the level of strategy, we are very certain we embrace new economy. We want to reform the economic structure for the better. Yeah. And on the technical grounds, which are constantly readjusting. So it's already a very sophisticated approach to modernization. If you look at the tactical level, we not only have the five-year plan, which are produced after thousands of rounds of uh, consultative, we call consultative democracy. And they have uh, every March, we have this uh, two annual sessions, People's Congress and uh, political consultative conference, which were examining the implementation of these plans. Right. And then in November or December every year, we have a party central committee conference uh, uh, on economic affairs. So all these, we try to make constant readjustment. Then if your strategies are correct, that's crucial. That makes all the difference. For rings 20 years back, made, made a strategy for renewable energies, for electric cars. Now, China is the largest producer of wind energy, solar energy, electric cars. So that changes really the global balance. Uh, this year, China's export of automobiles, including uh, new energy cars, China surpassed Germany. So next year, uh, China will surpass Japan. China will become the largest uh, manufacture power for automobiles, especially new energy cars. So all these are revolutionary. Both German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the EU Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrowski said mm -hmm. recently that decoupling with China is the wrong answer. How do you think they came to that obvious conclusion? And uh, what does China's high quality development bring to the developed world? Uh, Indeed, you know, uh, if you look at the relations between China and Germany and China and Europe, uh, now China's larger trading partner was uh, Southeast Asia. 
and then Europe. And China is Germany's largest trading partner. And if you look into the future, German industries have to look to China for its uh, future prospects. For instance, again, automobile industry. Now we enter the new year. It's about big data. It's about computing capacity. It's about electric cars. The markets are in China, not in Europe, not the United States. Most technologies are in China, not in the West. And uh, given the size of Chinese population and this passion for new industries and uh, this uh, uh, the, the new industrial revolution is occurring in China. So European countries, Germany in particular, have to embrace, embrace, have to embrace Chinese economy and Chinese uh, whatever uh, manufacturing sectors. Finally, um, Professor Zhang, uh, China has repeatedly said that it's not going to seek hegemony. China will mm. never um, bully others or practice an expansionist policy. Mm. Well, mm. we does have that track record, as you just mentioned. And yet some people say, well, the past doesn't represent the future. You cannot say mm. simply because I didn't do it in the past, I will not do that in the future. Um, what is your reaction to such a kind of logic? Every five years, the party Congress will make important decision mm -hmm. about the, how to define this era. Yeah. When we define this year is uh, for peace and development, then we pursue these riot policies. So this is very important. So in a way, why the West prediction about the uh, uh, about China tends to be wrong? Uh, one reason is it failed to understand China as it is and failed to see this the merit of this Chinese philosophy. You always have an overall uh, trend identified and then produce the right strategy. And this is already part of the Chinese political culture. So why we should, you know, uh, bothering with these technical mistakes, even they are made, they can be corrected if your strategies are correct. So this really for the long-term interest of China and its neighbors and all the Chinese partners, include those in the West, there are no uh, interest in China to uh, fight this kind of uh, uh, pick up a war with other countries or for unless they uh, cut into China's uh, uh, fundamental interests. We have very clear red lines on the issue of Taiwan, on the issue of uh, South China Sea, etc. You know, if you cross red line, uh, we are very sure to we'll fight back. Many thanks to Professor Zhang Weiwei, Dean of the China Institute at Fudan University, joining me from Shanghai.